good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our listeners all over the world. I'm Barry Miller, your host of the Revamp Podcast. Today we have Katie Zimmer um, as a guest with us. She is the Global Director of the Deal Desk at Braze, and uh, we've been talking uh, for, for a few weeks over um, over email to try to coordinate this. I'm super excited. Usually, um, it's it just like, Katie, I've heard amazing things about you from, from people that have worked with you in the past, and I've heard um, amazing things even from the Deal Desk community. They're like, oh, you know Katie? So Katie is a, an all-star in the Deal Desk community, and it's, it's really awesome to have you on. So Katie, welcome. Thanks, Barry. I'm excited to be here, and uh, thank you for uh, unlocking a personal goal of mine uh, to be a Deal Desk influencer. It's official as of today, so super excited to be here. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's that's one of my goals in life is to unlock other people's milestones <laughs> and, their, and influencer status. So, so we we both Love win it. today. Um, so it's a good collaboration. So, Katie, um, tell us a bit about yourself, maybe even how you got into the deal desk world. Everyone has their own story, so we'd love to hear yours. Totally. Um, I I I always find that you know it's very rare that somebody graduates from school and says, I'm going to be in sales ops, let alone I'm going to be in deal desk. So I I believe everyone, myself included, has a unique story of how they ended up here. Uh, So I'm happy to share mine. Um, I graduated school with a degree in art history. So I was studying, mainly focused on uh, contemporary Russian photography. So let's just say a world away from SAS and deal desk. Um, So I moved into, where I started off uh, my career working at an online art and antiques marketplace. Uh, it was, you know, super small company. And of all the people there, you know, we needed somebody to help out with our Salesforce instance. Basically, they're like, Katie, you're the only one that can uh, do text to columns or in Excel. So it's you. That's just life of working at a tiny uh, startup. So I was really started my career uh, off as a Salesforce admin. Uh, moved in, moved er, to Braze and started off there a little over five years ago as a Salesforce analyst, which is really just a fancier way of saying Salesforce admin at the end of the day. Um, and a lot of the projects I had worked on as a Salesforce analyst at Braze were somewhat related to Deal Desk, right? So I helped implement opportunity products, for example, so that we were able to report on ACV or revenue by each product uh, line item that we sell. And in order to do that, of course, there was a large data migration piece, looking back through contracts, understanding which products do we sell and around which prices. So certainly a manual effort, but one that really put me in tune with our products and the way that we sell here at Braze. So in the fall of 2018, the company decided that we actually needed a function in-house that would not only, you know, assist salespeople in building out pricing for their contract, building out pricing for their customers, but also someone that can come in and help better automate our selling process. So, you know, no more order forms in Word coming up with a more seamless process for generating uh, contracts within Salesforce, making sure all the approvals are buttoned up. Someone that would review all of our contracts to ensure that you know, what we have on the contract matches what we have in Salesforce, our system of record. So I stepped into that role, uh, you know, again, in the fall of 2018. Prior to that, we did not have a deal desk up raised. So I've really worked to define the role, the function, the scope and build the team from the ground up. Uh, So like I said, you know, 2018 team of one hired my first deal desk analyst in May of 2020, uh, and she's in fact actually now our manager of the Americas, which is wonderful to see. Uh, and since then, have built out built out my team to be a total of 10, soon to be 11. We have a new hire starting in two weeks, so just incredible growth of building out the team within the last two years. Wow! Yeah, uh, one, two, two took two years, and then two to 11 <laughs> in the past two years. So that's mm-hmm. that's. Um, awesome growth and awesome to really hear the about the growth and, and your uh, specific career trajectory and your history. So I love that. Um, history to the art history major. Um, yeah, people yeah. tell me I'm crazy, but I can I can uh, point out a few parallels there. At the end of the day, to me, Deal Desk really is all about creative thinking, logic and problem solving, uh, you know, communication, 
building and defending an argument, all the same sort of skills necessary to write a good paper in college about Russian contemporary photography. So it may seem like we're on different ends of the spectrum there, but again, I'd argue that actually it's quite uh, quite parallel to one another. That's awesome. Um, I think, yeah, that would be a great course to, or a great podcast for a different time where you we go through Russian photography and then on one side and you're like, oh, this is parallel to the deal desk. <laughs> it's been a minute, Barry, since I was since I've flexed uh, my art history skills. I've graduated from college quite some time ago, but you can test my knowledge maybe one day. <laughs> I'll have to prepare for that one. I can't say I'm ready <laughs> with Russian contemporary art. Um, but uh, but so next one. <laughs> so next one, yeah. Cool. So let's talk about that one to eleven and that growing deal desk team. Uh, what has your experience been like growing a global deal desk? Um, <laughs> take it away. Yes. Yeah, so you know, prior to May 2020, when I hired my first deal desk analyst, I actually was an individual contributor. Contributor. So I hadn't even managed people before. Um, I'm not really someone that does it by the book, so to speak. So like, you know, Google, I spent some time Googling like how to manage people. And I'm like, oh no, this isn't for me. I'm going to learn, do it as I go. Right. And so, you know, luckily I've hired such incredible, incredible people uh, that really make it easy to be a manager. But, you know, with my first hire being in May, 2020, I actually hired most of my team during the pandemic. So we onboarded, you know, virtually, uh, across multiple time zones as well. So I have people on my team in New York, San Francisco, Chicago, London, and Singapore. Uh, so when you're when you're talking about Singapore, that's a 12 hour time difference, uh, which can be challenging, but myself and my team were up for we're up for any any challenge here. And I think what's really, you know, one of my big learnings uh, of growing the team and something that I take so seriously going forward is onboarding. So when I onboard new uh, members of the DLS team, we used to have daily one-on-ones uh, with their manager, whether that be myself or one of my managers I have on the team, at least for 30 minutes, right? We co- we have a whole rubric of topics that we cover. We do scenario uh, role-playing as well. So I actually go you know, back through some of the requests that have been submitted earlier in the quarter by some of our salespeople. Tweak, like tweak them up a little bit and have my team members, you know, write responses back as if they were deal desk responding to a ticket, or we'll get on the phone and, you know, play it out as if we were on a call with the salespeople, just so that they, you know, my team feels comfortable when it comes time to actually start picking up tickets of their own and speaking to the sales team. They're not thrown in the deep water without a life jacket, right? They've, they've gone through this. They've seen the different types of asks, um, and they, they know they're confident and know how to go in and, you know, solve the problem alongside sales, which has proven to be super helpful, uh, because confidence here is, is really key. Uh, I like to joke that salespeople can smell fear and they certainly can, uh, but, you know, just coming in and, and feeling like, you know, the material, you know, the, the, the answer is super helpful. So that has been one of my my biggest learnings of growing the team. And it's it's also, this is a little bit of more of a personal note, but for me, I've always found it tricky to not just like take someone's mouse and be like, this is how you do it. And having that, taking that step back, because unfortunately, who knows, maybe one day in the metaverse, we'll be able to like <laughs> drag someone else's mouse and it, with our avatars. But right now that's impossible. So really being able to, whether it's by, now by uh, choice, but back earlier in the pandemic, by just nature of f- force, really not ha- having people drive on their own, right, and not having to step in was really a big learning for me at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense, and you're really putting the global into the global deal desk. I love that. Yeah, uh, global is not just a buzzword for me. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, the, it's the truth. <laughs> I love that. Um, because <laughs> all you need is two people, two countries for it to be global, but you are the real global. Um, and then how many of the people that you hired are, are former art history majors, or is there anyone specific, or were you not looking for that? <laughs> um, I, I mean, no, no one on my team is an art history major. I mean, <laughs> us, us art history majors are a small but mighty group to begin with, but I will say very, actually very few people on my team have like direct deal desk experience. 
Um, you know, I have somebody on my team who is a, you know, certified lawyer in Australia, right? So we have just a totally of the full gamut of different skills, right? Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, and Deal Desk is very much an up and coming role as well. So it's tricky to find somebody that has, you know, two to three years of direct Deal Desk experience working with the, you know, set of tools that we work with. It's just really more of a, a soft skills assessment for me. Uh, you know, does this person like a challenge? Is this person able to work autonomous, autonomously? Are they a good problem solver, good communicator, enjoy working cross-functionally and supporting sales teams? So, you know, without that direct level of experience, it hasn't been, you know, so much of an issue. And I, I really applaud and appreciate the diversity in the background, uh, different backgrounds on my team. Yeah, absolutely. It must be also more fun. And uh, you mentioned that uh, the two, three years, like experience, we don't, it's hard to find those people. It reminds me of like some Reddit, like thread I once saw where they're like looking for people with 10 years of X experience with this, like Python and Python only existed for eight, like five years, but they wanted someone for 10 years experience and that doesn't exist. It's yeah. impossible. Uh, so that it makes a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> I love those call outs. So let's move on. So now we have the people, let's move on to the technology. Um, so what tooling systems does your deal desk team uh, use in order to accomplish its goals? So uh, we recently actually just went live with Deal Hub, which we're using as our CPQ tool. Um, so prior to that, we had been, you know, doing our pricing outside of Salesforce. There was no guided selling, less automation, uh, you know, less product dependencies. For example, if I purchase product A, I must purchase product B. And that was all done via, you know, manual addition of products to Salesforce and audits and checks by my team uh, at the final stages. So we've recently moved again within the last, you know, six weeks or so over to Deal Hub. Our sales team is, you know, thrilled with the switch. I believe uh, we at some quote, I, have, I made a hype reel, one could say, in the format of a TikTok, just to psych up, psych all the salespeople up uh, or hype them up really, and took some nice uh, quotes from the sales team. You know, some of them are saying, I can't believe we haven't had this sooner, or I just built a quote in five minutes. This is amazing. So the end of the day, ensuring that we are giving our salespeople time to sell and not to do admin or manual work is really important, not only to me, but to our whole organization. So we've seen that with Deal Hub. Uh, prior to that, we had been using tools like Conga Composer, which I'm a big fan of, uh, that allows you to generate Word documents directly from information in Salesforce. So we were using like essentially a homegrown CPQ that I had built, which you know would track all of our approvals uh, in, or any changes to language inside of Salesforce and would spit out order forms in PDF format, which means as a salesperson, I can't go in and change or, or add my own language. Everything needed to be approved in the system before it showed on an order form. And aside from, you know, Deal Hub, Congo, which we're now going to move off of as we have, you know, CPQ, or Deal Hub CPQ comes with order form or doc gen capabilities. Uh, we also use DocuSign, which we have for both internal approvals as well as customer execution and uh, Braze execution of documents, as well as, of course, the big one, Salesforce. Uh, we're a Salesforce shop here. Uh, I am a Salesforce nerd, tried and true. Um, I'm a ranger on Trailhead, just saying, <laughs> like self taught on Salesforce. And I have, I really have the belief that it's, you could build anything in Salesforce that you want. So we, we've leveraged it quite a bit over here at Braze. Hey, awesome. Well, um, thank you. I'd love to see that TikTok hype reel. And <laughs> you and everybody else at Deal Hub, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I, I bet. Um, but that's awesome. And um, also nice um, pl- plug. So I appreciate it. Um, how does, I think we're going to, so now we're going to move. So before we were talking about people, technology, now we're going to move to processes. Okay. So the big three. Um, how does your deal desk team manage requests, cases? I'm sure that they have a lot of uh, requesting cases from the sales team. Yes. So uh, as you mentioned earlier on in the 
caller in the podcast, excuse me. Um, I'm pretty active in the Deal Desk community on the Deal Desk Association group in LinkedIn, uh, which if you are a Deal Desk professional and you are not in that group, I highly recommend you join it. Uh, it's incredible, great resource. Uh, people are, you know, always eager to jump in and help and answer, you know, questions, especially if you're newer to growing a Deal Desk team. I wish I had had this resource way back when. Anyway, the nu- the number one question people ask me. Uh, I do some, you know, meetups with people in the group. They always ask me, how do you manage uh, requests from the sales team? Because typically deal desk teams are a lot leaner uh, than your sales org, right? And it's easy for things to fall through the cracks. Plus, as a deal desk leader, you want the ability to report on, you know, number of cases, uh, opportunity influence. Are you meeting your SLAs or service level agreements and so on? So we've actually built out this process in Salesforce. Uh, we, though, you could build out something similar whether you're using another CRM like HubSpot or Salesforce, you know, itself. There's a lot of different ways to do this. We actually are doing it via a custom object, but you could use the case object, which is native to Salesforce as well. And essentially, if salespeople will click a button on any opportunity or account, which therefore then links the case or request to the op, so we can pull in any opportunity data as well. Uh, we have formulas that track, you know, when the when the op or sorry when the case was accepted, so we can report on turnaround time. We even have something that I personally am a big fan of called Deal Desk difficulty, which is a self-reported scale of one to four. So one being the easiest request and four being something that's more difficult. Right? It's all self-reported. There's no rubric because someone else's or one person's four could be someone else's one, depending on tenure you know, experience and so on. So this, you know, has been super helpful for us, not just from a reporting standpoint, but from, you know, a bandwidth standpoint, I'm able to create reports in Salesforce and see who has what in their queue. So if one of my team members has like, you know, 15 requests in their queue, another one has 20, then I I, I can step in and pick some up. Or I could tell, you know, someone that has five that they may need to step in and help out regardless of what region, right? Uh, additionally, like I mentioned earlier on in the podcast, we actually use these requests to help create scenarios for onboarding new hires. So I'll go back through, look at requests and, that were submitted by salespeople in a given quarter and use those for our role-playing or scenarios. Uh, additionally, we'll do an audit of the requests, most likely on like a quarterly basis to identify knowledge gaps, process improvements, and so on, you know, trends really at the end of the day, so that we can beef up things like enablement, resources, documentation, or even if we see if a certain ask come up multiple times, how do we build that into our process to make, you know, the sales team's you know, workflow easier and st- more streamlined at the end of the day. So there's just a ton of benefits to having a fully built out, uh, you know, case or request process. I can speak to it for days, so <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, that's that's super helpful. I, I do have one follow-up question. How long sure. does it take to do something like that, to build it, that process? Obviously, it's not perfect, but the first V1, how long does it take? I would say from, you know, from the Salesforce admin side, if you're an advanced, even an intermediate admin, it's pretty simple. Like I, like a week, it's mm-hmm. really, it's nothing too difficult. You're, you're just using, and we'll get super technical here, using screen flows, uh, which is what, you know, is going to be the new norm for Salesforce from a process automation standpoint, as they, you know, move from workflow and process builder onto flow anyway. Um, and I am also a flow natic, uh, which just means you love flow in Salesforce. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's nothing nothing too tricky. There's tons of good documentation on Salesforce, even if you're not a Salesforce admin, um, but you do have some Salesforce admin rights uh, or you you know, are looking for how to best direct your Salesforce admin. Tons of documentation on creating screen flows is available online and it's it's actually quite simple to execute on. Okay, awesome. the ROI The ROI on this is huge too, yeah. I will say so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one... F- big one that falls through the cracks that ROI fixes that right away. If you capture all of those big ones so that nothing right. falls through the cracks, that professional. <laughs> the, yeah. and, 
then this is someone coming from the outside. I can only imagine how I. Um, the only thing I will add is then, you know, there is a change management piece here of, you know, mm-hmm. ensuring that the sales team submits requests and doesn't submit asks over Slack, over email, over chatter, and really stay, st- sticking to your ground that if a request comes in via Slack, you know, or to you directly, I'll just say submit a request. At the end of the day, it's actually, if you're in sales or any other team that the deal desk supports, it's in your best interest to do so because the requests go out to the entire global team, right? So you're better off sending a request to, you know, 10 or 11 people than just one person. Uh, So, you know, especially when you have a global team that covers 24 hours a day, it's anything that, you know, is left in the queue from the EMEA teams in the morning, the Americas teams can pick up. Something that's left over from the West, my Singapore or APAC team can pick up. So it's way, it's, it's just much it's better you're better off you know sending out something that gets sent to multiple people than just one so you really got to sell it to your your users as well and stick your stick to your ground uh to ensure that you're not you know continuing to answer via email or via slack so in, in instilling those good behaviors in the teams you work with is key to ensuring that this is a success yeah no, that makes that makes a lot of sense i was thinking back um, i used to work at ways and because it's like a B two C product, everyone thinks everyone just talks to you like as if they're your friend, and that you can actually make changes. <laughs> so you're like, "This ways took me to the wrong place today. Fix this, please." I'm like, "Yeah, I'm in marketing. <laughs> like, here, here's here's the link. Like, maybe you downloaded it because of me, but you definitely didn't make the wrong turn because of me. I don't even know who to talk to. So here's the link, and and um, so I had to change management." everyone after they found out I started working there. So, um, but yeah, also like really in, in a lot of, com- I think it's great advice for every company, even now in product marketing, enabling the team with the case studies. Oh, they ask, where can we find it? I always tell them where they can find it versus uh, me just sending them the case study for them to send. Mm-hmm. So it's a good, um, exactly change management system for any person listening, uh, their deal desk or not. Um, so let's talk about pain points. We talked about people, we talked about tech, we talked about processes. Now let's get, I guess, to the nitty gritty, if you will. Uh, some of the pain points um, on the deal desk, it could be an 11 person pain point or a one person pain point. And um, what have you done to alleviate um, these some of these pain points? Right, so I, I think, you know, and I'll speak more generally towards all deal desks perhaps here, but accuracy, is certainly a pain point. And, you know, we've used this expression here at Braze, but I think it is applicable to all deal desks. In fact, my team jokes sometimes, should we get this as like a tattoo, but like maybe we should. Um, But it's, you know, slow is smooth and smooth is fast, right? So what I mean by that is if you, especially at peak times, like end of quarter, you have all these salespeople breathing down your neck, essentially saying the customer's waiting to sign this right now. I need you to do your review as quick as possible. So you have you have pressure, you're trying to move fast, that leads to mistakes, right? Especially when there is more manual work required on the salesperson's part, whether that be entering in products manually or generating contracts or order forms manually, filling information on an opportunity in Salesforce manually, right? They're just more, however, wherever you do not have automation and you have manual input, there's room for error, right? So we've moved to... CPQ, most recently to uh, Deal Hub at that, which helps us, you know, better automate our systems and tools to ensure more accuracy. And there will be a day, you know, further down the road where everything is super buttoned up. The system doesn't allow for anything not, you know, to be entered incorrectly, which we would need to spend even less time on our reviews or even make said reviews go away altogether. There's also it's difficult to measure accuracy as well. Right. So how do I identify where mistakes were made, what the mistake was, and then either how do I better train my team uh, to you know, avoid said mistakes in the future, or how do I create better resources and enablement to prevent salespeople from making those mistakes? So accuracy is certainly a large one. Um, you know, working, and I don't have an answer for this one. It's a point two would be working on deal desk is certainly a very cross-functional role, right? So you're at least uh, Braze, our, our largest customer is the sales team, 
uh, who we support, you know, in order to best structure their deals, help with more non-standard order forms, uh, or even, you know, signature processes, what have you. But that's not to say that we don't work with nearly every other team in the organization, right? Most closely after sales being legal and finance. So finding coming, which, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of these different branches, if you will, legal, finance, or accounting and sales may all want different, you know, different things. So coming coming up with a solution that works for both party for all three parties really uh, fits within you know your company's acceptable policies and guidelines and communicating that across teams is certainly a challenge but one that I would argue makes the job more fun. Yeah, no absolutely. Um, cross team collaboration we hear it over and over again so it's definitely not just uh, braids that's every company. And what what was the line again? I love the line I forgot it though so repeat it for me. Uh, my God, now I'm going to forget it. <laughs> That's why I want to tattoo That's it. No. Your pressure to forget. <laughs> yeah. Putting me in the spot. No, uh, slow is, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Slow is right? smooth is fast. If your because team if- gets a tattoo on that, I'm sure I can get someone at you'll have to sponsor. <laughs> so. No, I, like at the end of the day, it really does make a lot of sense. Right. Because when you, it's take your time and you do something accurately that saves time in the long run versus if you rush, you make a mistake, you have to do an amendment, then you're actually spending more time not selling than if you spent, you know, the extra 15 minutes on your review to ensure that everything was accurate and there were, no, you know, everything on the contract adds up correctly, that the data and the opportunity is, you know, matches what's on the order form and it's, you know, all buttoned up, way better mm-hmm. off to take that extra time. Slow is smooth and smooth is fast. That's what you should title this episode, by the way. Um, <laughs> slow is smooth and smooth is fast with Katie's and men. No, um, but yeah, it really does save you time in the long run. So, you know, ensuring that your team isn't rushing and, and that they're able to kind of push off or brush away any pressure from other teams is really important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, as a product marketer, I remember doing this one exercise. I, more than a year ago, but just, I I was trying to say that go fast um, with, with your sales proposals, you can create your order forms fast with deal hub, CPQ, et cetera. But then I was like, anyone can do anything fast. It just might be terrible. (laughs) So it's that differentiation of like, yes, you can go fast, but then it might be really bad. So slow, smooth, (laughs) smooth as fast. Right. And I, I mean, I even think, as it relates to like metrics and the reporting on, you know, the cases that we touched on earlier, it's even having like, we call them OKRs or like goals or objectives for your team. I'm always a little wary to put in, you know, meeting SLAs because I don't want the team to rush uh, Mm -hmm. to meet, you know, their service level agreement. So for example, that requests will be done in two days. Mm -hmm. I don't want someone to rush through to meet that goal, but if in fact it actually will take them longer. So yep. it's important, I think, accuracy over speed any day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, it's a little different, but I once watched a, um, a webinar from Monday.com um, and they, on like customer success, and they were talking about like, if you have this SLA, they didn't call it SLA, they call it KPI. But if you have this um, KPI, then you might end up with the wrong, uh, the wrong thing. Uh, because right. the objectives are different. They're just going, trying to go faster and you don't want that <laughs> um, if it, there's going to be mistakes. So absolutely. Um, I think we're going to move now to processes and people and maybe even career field as trajectory uh, is to categorize the next two questions. So what is your onboarding process for new uh, deal that's players entail? Um, there's pro- what are the processes had um, we, we touched on onboarding before, so maybe there's not yeah. uh, too much more to add. So if you don't have anything else to add, then don't worry about it, but we'd love to hear some more processes. If there is anything specific you'd like to add. Yeah. So, you know, I, I really, uh, I can't emphasize this enough, but onboarding is, you know, so important to ensuring the success of your new deal desk hires, right? You want to make sure that they are confident and comfortable you know, when it comes time to them to fully go out on their own. Uh, And you got to walk 
got to crawl before you can walk, walk before you can jog and jog before you can sprint. So typically, you know, we are a SaaS business. So we have we're both new business deals as well as renewals and upsells. So we'll actually start off on the more simpler side of the business and then move on to, you know, once the new hire shows mastery and understanding of new business, we'll move on to some more complex, you know, renewal and upsell deals. So really at the end of the day, you just want to make sure that you're getting those quick wins and those confidence boosters first before you move on to more challenging material, uh, taking somebody who's on week one and putting them on the most complex deal that the team is working on this quarter is probably not the best idea, right? You want to start small uh, and really just, you know, not only to ensure that they have that confidence, but really to like build the foundation, the building blocks before you can start to tackle on more complex deals. If you're using Salesforce, I would also recommend, you know, giving your team or new hires like sandbox access so they can go around and play with, you know, put put themselves in the salesperson's shoes. So maybe move an opportunity through the entire sales process and see which fields they need to fill out before moving to a certain stage and really like being able to empathize with the teams that you're helping to is super important. Uh, So yeah, I mean, I, I think I covered a lot of the onboarding stuff earlier on just by nature of the conversation, but I, I'm a huge believer in, I hate this phrase, but I don't really know what, what, if you think of another way or another way to say this, um, please let me know, but teach a man to fish, right? Like, you know, go through the steps as if they really are dealing directly with the salespeople so that they have that knowledge, they have that confidence, you know, to go out into, into the real world. Now I have like, like, you know, sending them off to like college, we're going to go work with the, with the sales team. Uh, So yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's definitely an investment, but one that I would argue has made my team so successful and really at the end of the day, respected across the whole sales organization too, because everyone is, knows what they're talking about by the time that they go into the field. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And then how many, how much time is that usually? Um, I don't really like to put a like time. No, no SLAs. No SLAs. <laughs> well, also people move, people learn differently too, right? right? Like, um, I, I mean, I wasn't an education minor, but I was one class away from one. Um, so <laughs> you could say I was close, but I am someone that is really believes in different learning styles, different learning paces. And just mm-hmm. like, you know, if one person, and I've onboarded at this point, you know, t- upwards of like eight people, maybe a little less on my own. It's simpler right now, but everybody's onboarding goes a little bit differently. Like you could be having a conversation and, you know, naturally just like how we're having a question comes up about another topic that would, we would cover later on uh, down the list. Right. I'm not going to say not now that's for week seven, if it's coming up naturally. And if the, you know, new hire is asking that question, let's address it then and there. Typically I'll say like, you know, if you did, if you did ask me to put a time frame on it, I would say 90 days, mm-hmm. uh, though some people move quicker than that. Uh, others take a little more time at, the, you know, at the end of the day, I want that person to tell me uh, I'm ready and I don't want to push people in if, if they don't feel like they're up, up for it quite yet. If we need to do a few more, more scenarios, but for the most part, my team has gotten up to speed within, I would say even less than 90 days, most people. Yeah. So. Oh, absolutely. It sounds like a cool, like if anyone's listening that that's an entrepreneur, some good tech to do like role playing in the deal desk um, kind of thing. I think that could be um, a cool gamification kind of thing going on over there. And that can I actually, be- <laughs> I actually did gamify it. Okay. Um, and so maybe you should start it. <laughs> Barry, with what time, Barry? But um, <laughs> I, for one of my new hires, I actually created like different levels. Um, and I, he always would sit in a gaming chair. So, I mean, I, I'm not a video gamer, but <laughs> I'm, I'm like a, a phone gamer, but that's for another time. Um, but I ca- like had all the different le- uh, levels as different uh, tracks in uh, Mario Kart. Uh, you know, like the most difficult level was Rainbow Road, yep. uh, just to make it a little bit more fun. Uh, I would say, you know, I love a good gamification moment. 
Um, hence why I am a ranger and trailhead because I just needed to get <laughs> to the next badge. If you know what I mean, all my other rangers or trailheaders out there. Uh, but yeah, you know, make it fun too. Uh, because that's, you know, I also believe that people do the best work or do their best work when they enjoy what they're doing. So, you know, it doing, and you could cater it to your different team members interests. Um, but is, is it also fun for you as the, you know, hiring manager to take a little, uh, step back into memory lane and think about what courses of Mario Kart were <laughs> the most difficult for me? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think as it would be your responsibility as a manager to play replay the games uh, and to remember that. There, <laughs> thinking of gamification, the one gamification I don't appreciate is I sometimes use this company called GetTax, which is a competitor of Uber, and they like remind like I get like awarded if I use them so often. I'm like, no, I don't want to be using cabs. <laughs> this is the Hi. opposite. I don't want to be a warrior. I want to be a person that. Uses public or my own car. <laughs> Don't reward me now. <laughs> um, so again, it's just a funny answer there. I was thinking. Yeah. Um, so with regards to deal desk hires, um, I guess we can even use this as a pitch if you're if you're recruiting currently. I guess everyone's always recruiting, right? Uh, what do you look like, uh, for in your in your deal desk hires? I think I also touched on this a little bit earlier uh, yeah. in the podcast, but you know. What I said what earlier was it's hard to find people that have the direct deal desk skill because it is such a new or niche industry. So really what I look for is somebody who, you know, is excited by a new challenge or a new problem to solve that, you know, the most difficult of requests or asks from the sales team are actually the ones that make you jump out of bed in the morning and that you're ready to go tackle versus you know, not wanting to pick it up because you're like, oh no, this is going to be too much. So someone that loves problem solving, loves a challenge, like loves doing something new every day. Cause I can tell you, and I'm sure most DLS professionals would agree. No day is the same. You think you've seen every creative, uh, you know, solution from salespeople, but let me uh, tell you, you haven't, they will think of something new. <laughs> So somebody that, you know, enjoys that challenge, somebody that can work autonomously and, you know, with pretty little guidance, especially when you're talking about, you know, time zones being quite far away from our HQ, which is in New York. Um, and somebody who is a good communicator is huge, both written and verbally, right? Because I, I look at, you know, deal desk almost like the command center, really. Uh, and you're helping to the salespeople to like understand how we got to a certain number for pricing, how the pricing works, how to defend that pricing to a sales uh, to a buyer or to a procurement team. So you know, really being a, a a good communicator is super important. And finally, and this one's a little bit of a more of a softer skill, and I I don't want to give away my interview question that I always ask. Um, but working really closely with the sales team is huge and somebody that will enjoy working with sales and that sales will enjoy working with, uh, right? Because I believe that, you know, having the ability to build or forge, you know, trusting relationships and genuine relationships with your end users or customers, which for the most part in our case is the sales team, is so important for a few reasons. One, it makes it easier to shut it down when uh, the sales team is being creative. It helps garner respect and trust. And lastly, it makes your job more fun um, <laughs> if you enjoy the people that you're working with. So that to me is, you know, somebody that will, I can picture working really well with our sales team and that I can picture working really well with our deal desk team, our larger revenue operations and finance teams is really key to me as well. Awesome. Well, Katie, I feel like we've developed a genuine uh, relationship during this uh, podcast. Not saying that yeah. applying for a deal that's position, but uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, you're obviously has lived up to the word I heard beforehand from my team and from some people externally. So thank you for that. Thank you for uh, joining early on a Monday morning. Uh, our listeners are listening to it on Thursday, but for you, uh, Monday, I appreciate that. And um, yeah, looking forward to seeing the Braves team continue to grow and, and see 
um, and see your ranger status continue to grow and everything. And continue There's nothing to- higher than ranger, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> that that goal's been unlocked for a while now. <laughs> there will be. There will be. I don't know why. <laughs> next up, it's got to be, I got to learn Excel without ever clicking my mouse. That's my next goal. I'll tell you how to do it. Because I was, I was a finance major. You need to take one of those investment banking courses. Four days. And you'll know way too much about finance, but you'll know how to use um, Excel without picking up your mouse. How do well, I could use Excel pretty well, but you know all the short codes don't apply on Macs, and we're we're a Mac house here, uh, not oh. a PC. Oh, so that rule number one for investment banking was not to use Macs. <laughs> so so um, so you'd maybe have to take a creative <laughs> course on that. Now I now everyone uses Macs even. And IB, I think, is starting to use more Macs. Um, but I guess now we're making this more about me and you and Macs and Excel. So before we, Katie and I continue that conversation, I wanted to thank our um, listeners for listening. Um, please reach out. Um, Katie, if they have any questions, where's the best place they can reach you? Um, they can either you know, send me a message on LinkedIn or and we can connect from there. Um, yeah, that's probably the best, best place to reach me. Okay, cool. And then I remember you mentioning the Deal Desk Association that you're part yes. of. So, um, I guess that's more collective uh, questioning to you, but uh, it's also on the LinkedIn platform. So Katie, thanks again for coming on and looking forward to staying in touch. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Barry. So nice chatting with you.